So welcome into the shop again. All right, this, this video series is going to be on the most common asked question that we get regarding the workshop courses or the in-house workshop. And that question is typically, what kind of experience do I have to have in order to attend one of your workshops? The simple answer is you need no experience making any type of boat canvas at all. What you need to have is sewing experience. And when I say sewing experience, I simply mean that you need to be able to control a sewing machine. Start, stop, load it, unload it, you know, prepare the bobbin, know how it works, and be able to control it to where you can actually drive and are comfortable with that. You don't want to pay money to come in here for me to teach you how to sew. Um, so if you continue to watch this video, I'm going to go into some pretty basic um, but necessary um, sewing lessons that you can do on your own to get yourself to where you're up to par with the sewing. Um, I, I'm going to go through how to do a flat felled seam, how to sew it, which is what you do for making bimini tops and mooring covers, and also going to do some darts, some basic darts, how to sew them up, and also some basic binding, how to do binding and just practice. So this is what this whole series is, is just getting yourself up to par sewing wise. So then you're ready to come to the in-house work workshop where I'm going to teach you how to fabricate. Those are the things that I think is the big, biggest um, unknown for people is how to actually do the fabrication and they have never done the fabrication so therefore they think they don't have the experience to come into the workshop which that's not the case i'm going to teach you that what i want you to learn on your own is how to sew so pay attention to the rest of this video and follow those steps that i'm going to show you get proficient at it and then call me up we'll get you scheduled we'll get you into the workshop and we'll make you a fabricator so when you start doing practice sewing um, you know, of course, if you've never sewn before, just get a piece of material out here, put it in there and push that treadle down and let it go and see what's going on. But once you've got the feel for it and you know how to, to set everything up and everything, the stitch line and everything is good, um, I just use one layer of fabric. And what I like to do is I just take a pencil, right? And it doesn't have to be straight, but I'm going to come oh, I hit the side of my table, damn it. Well, let's just keep going. All right, just make a make squares, right? You start off with squares because this and don't change this. I want you to I want you to do this until you've got it down before you start move, moving anything else. Materials relatively cheap. You can use any type of material as long as it's thick enough to sew with just one layer. So a piece of sunbrella works out good. But the goal here is to teach yourself that your right hand is a guide and your left hand is what actually steers. This is what drives everything, is your left hand on this side. So put everything outboard, and with your inconsistent lines, your goal is to just stay and sew. Notice my right hand. Right hand, just nothing more than just a reference guide, right? And I'm driving it with my left hand, but your goal is to get up here, and without using your hand on the treadle, right, or on the wheel, I want you to be able to come and stop. If you get within one stitch, you can roll that around to the absolute corner. Lift your foot up. I, and there again, I recommend getting a knee lift because what we do, we always have stuff in our hands. And when you're turning, you know, a lot of times big stuff, you want to be able to lift your foot without having to reach around here and pull that thing up. But stay consistent and go slow. If you have a servo motor, turn it down at this point, right? So that you can just chug along but I want you to be able to chug along on that line and then come right here and go bam and stop right on the corner. That's, that's what's going to make you a good fabricator is if you can get your stitch lines absolutely perfect. Um, so just come through, drive it, keep it slow and your, your start is one stitch and your start and your stop is what we're trying to achieve here. So drive it, stop. Right there, bam. This is treadle control. It's steering control and treadle control from down below. Okay, once you've got that, and I and I would, you know, 
you be your own judge. If you're not if you're not dead on exactly and you get all the way through it, draw another piece out and keep doing this until you can stay exactly on that line. Now, one other thing that you can start doing once you've got the the sewing of this the steering right is you can come up to a corner, come up to a corner right here, and this happens a lot. You want to come up and then back tack. That I just I just ran out of thread. Hold on one second. If you've not watched this section on sewing machine maintenance and stuff, um, go back and watch that if you don't know what we're doing with the. All right, so let's see where are we at here. You want to start three or four stitches, four or five stitches. That's about you know you want to keep it within an inch. You don't want to back tack more than an inch, but sew up, back tack, keep on going. Come all the way up to the next corner, back tack, come back forward, and stop. Turn it, go, back tack. Now your goal here is, let me, your goal here is to get this so it only looks like there's more stitches. You don't have them, you want to be right on top of your stitch line for your back tacks, all right? So forward, back tack, forward, stop. Now I got Forward, back, back, forward. All right, so this is coming to the end of this thing, but I want to show you something. This is, uh, this machine is set for that. See how fast that machine's going? That's the way I have it set, and I'm actually using treadle for control on there. So this thing is going to, I mean, it's going to blast. I don't know, the servo motor is supposed to have the same amount of torque no matter what the RPM of the machine is going, but I do know that it's not completely true. The, if you have the machine turned all the way up, you're going to get more power. So if you're sewing from canvas going up onto a piece of clear, you want the power so that you can stay consistent with your sewing with your treadle speed, right? And so that the machine doesn't stop or bog down. So I you know if you can get the machine to where it's turned all the way up and then learn how to control the treadle and still do that you're going to be way better off in the future if it's really really hard for you to do that you know just turn the machine down until you get good and then consistently turn it up so you can get that speed built back in there and honest to god if, if this doing this process right here is really all you need to know. So the basic sewing guide that's gonna come into one of our workshops, if he has this down to a science, I can teach him how to fabricate, all right? I can teach you how to fabricate, but you need to learn how to sew on your own before you get in here. And this is what I say, sew on your own, it's, it's driving the sewing machine, not making parts and pieces. We could care about that. I'll teach you how to make parts and pieces. It's learning how to run the sewing machine is what's, what's critical, okay? Well, so good luck, go do that, and uh, I'll hear from you later. So here's another one. This one is um, what we call a flat filled seam. And this is what you do to join most any two pieces of fabric together. Um, it's very, very critical, especially on bimini tops, um, mooring covers, anytime you're gonna put material together to make a blank, this is what you do. You do a flat filled seam. Um, you know, typically we want to call it three eighths, but usually it's about a half of an inch. When I say half of an inch, what I'm talking about is from the stitch line to the edge of the material, 
is one half of an inch. Some people go through and base this stuff together. I typically don't like to do that because over time the basting tape will heat up and kind of goo out and make sort of a mess. So anytime you can do this without basting it, you're better off. So again, what I'm doing here is I'm using my left hand to drive, okay? And my right hand is nothing more than a guide. So if I'm, I'm seeing it visually once and then I'm also putting a finger down and I'm letting the material rub next to my finger but my right hand isn't moving so I have another sense that's kicking in here so to keep myself straight so if I put my finger down and as I'm sewing I can feel the material rubbing on my finger if you know if I miss you know if it gets big I can I can really tell if I'm if I'm making a mistake there and these things are what you call make or break on a project so if you don't sew this rough cloth together properly and get a really nice first stitch line, very straight first stitch line, consistent seam allowance the whole way, if you wave it through there, when you come back and do your top stitch, you're going to see all of that in the project, whether it be a top or a mooring cover or anything else. Now what we do is we take it and we fold it over after we put our first seam in and you can run your fingers down and just crease this over. But the objective here, if you look, the objective is to sew on the inside and you want to have about a quarter of an inch, maybe three eighths, but about a quarter of an inch of seam, allow seam allowance from both stitch lines and those have these two stitch lines be completely parallel one another. And I'll show you what I'm talking about when I sew this. So I'm going to line this up and I'm going to actually use an edge of my foot, or one of the toes right there, as a guide. Now this time I can't really use my hand, my hand as a guide. I guess I, I could, but I typically don't. What I like to do is I spread this out so that it's nice and even. And then my, I'm just using a visual reference mark and I'm putting the, this crease right in between those two toes right there. And I'm making sure that I have a consistent pullout when I'm pulling these two things apart. And now if you look here, um, I actually didn't even do it that great myself. So see how, see how this has got a nice parallel stitch line right there? Not like this is bad because people aren't ever going to see this. This is typically going to be the inside. but. When you start doing this, you can see how it, it can become a little bit difficult. But <clears throat> for practice, what you do is I want you to just sew these together, fold it over, top stitch it just like that, and then you can come right back in here and you can just cut this off and cut this off and then just come right back and do it again. So put these together. Start it, uh, put these together, hold your threads down, start it, line it up. And if this, is, if this is really big, the only thing you're concerned with is this one foot of fabric. Let everything else go, front and back on you. This is the only thing that matters right here. Another reason why we have our sewing table built so that it comes inside of our foot, you can see how this is you know, the, the needle is right here, so I leave myself about an inch and a half, and it's just for this reason. That way I can hold this all down and push it into the sewing machine. So hand as a guide again, I'm gonna put it down. Very straight, consistent stitch. See that? Fold it over. Now it doesn't matter which way you fold this. I tend to like to fold it so that I'm top stitching on the outboard side. You can do it the other way as well. Crease it out, hold it, make sure you get an even pull side to side on it. And you have a nice even parallel stitch.
all through there. So again, just you know, just keep doing that. Just cut it off, sew it, and and if you get bored with this, good. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. It's supposed to be, you know, brainless to get that. Now remember that, I, and I say this all the time, but this very first stitch line, whenever you're putting this stuff together, is the foundation for the entire project. If you mess this part up, the entire project is going to be messed up. So. If you're new, I highly recommend that you just do this over and over and over and over. Take it, throw it away. You can even keep them and see how consistent you can start to make them. But one more time, I'm going to do it one more time for you. On there, half inch, hold your threads, start it. And if you get good at this, you should be able to you know, speed that up just a little bit Come over here. Do the same thing over and over and over and over. All right, so this, that again is called a flat filled, flat filled seam, and it's what's used for primarily everything that we make. Um, mooring covers, bimini tops, you know, seat covers, cushion covers, you know, all kinds of covers. We do a flat filled seam, so learn this. So this is a good, um, this is a good practice technique also. Now I've already, this is, I'm gonna do some darts here. Now I've already done um, a video and I think it's on YouTube I believe it may just be under our free courses on the website I'm not sure where it's located at but I, I just kind of wanted to put all this together so I'm going to do it again um, typical typical dart which means you, you want to take this this amount of fabric out of here if you're going around corners or you're going around a windshield or something like that um, the easy thing to do is to draw out these lines so that you can see them and you can fold one line just right on top of the other, which that, that's going to make a dart. And you can see that this is the tip and the, and the bottom of the dart. Always on whenever we're doing any type of patterning, we always indicate, and it's just done with a line at the bottom, we indicate which side goes on top because sometimes it will make a difference. The difference if this was a mooring cover and I was to take this on this side and fold it over the top of this line it would shape different than if I was to take this side and go over the the, the back side believe me believe me that's true it doesn't seem like it would ma make any difference um, but it does it does make a difference and what it does is it makes a difference on which way the fabric lays on the inside and the way that you trim it off so that you can reinforce and bind the inside of it without having any rough fabric shown on the dart so just that's that's a little bit more advanced but but basically all you're going to do is you want to you want to fold this up put it over right on top of the line and here's the critical part is the tip of a dart always the tip of a dart so let me let me hold this up and you can see how see how i have that tip so that the the fabric doesn't cross the fabric doesn't go doesn't cross any higher than the tip that I drew right there. That's, that's very important. So when you, when you fold a dart over, I take my fingers and I rub that out and I actually have a, a stop spot right where the fold starts and stops at the top of that dart. When you sew this dart, what I want you to do is I want you to, bring, I want you to take from the tip of the dart from where your needle is and come down about an inch, about an inch. And here's how we're going to start this. You hold your thread down and you start it forward and stop it. And then when you reverse, I want you to back all the way up to that tip and then come back forward again. Okay? It's with, with that fold being started, it's really hard to get your needle to hit all four layers of material. Or I guess it's three layers of material through there and then start going. What happens is the, the presser foot wants to spread that out as you go. So if you come down and start on the fold and then back to the tip, you're going to be way better off. Hold it up, line it up, and then you always want to back tack the bottom of a, of a dart also. So back tack it, you cut this off, and now here's a little bit of what you can see. <clears throat> see I've got, the, I've got the sewing to the tip of the dart, 
and down here, this is, this is why we make the direction of the dart go one way or the other, for the, the direction that this fold goes. Um, I don't have a mooring cover course per se, but I've got a lot of mooring covers out there. Just know that whenever you fold a dart, if you're using fabric to do a pattern, or plastic, I guess it doesn't matter. When you fold a dart over to mark them, indicate which side you fold it over there, and that way when you get to the shop, you know that this side gets folded on there, or vice versa. So that's one way to do a dart. Here's another way. And typically, also, when we have, when we fold a dart over, we have a, a boat and we, we pull this over and we say that that's where we want the dart to lay, right? Well, I will mark the tip of the dart up here, mark the tip of the dart, and then I come down here and I just mark the bottom of it on both sides and then a line to indicate that that's the top of the dart. And those are the only lines that we need on here in order to grab the tip, grab the bottom, fold it over, crease it out, sew it down. Now, I'm going to jump right into just a different method of doing a dart. It's just a different way. This, is, this we typically do if we have a big dart. If you have a, a four foot or five foot long dart that's going from a windshield down to the gunnel on a boat, um, you don't want all of that extra material there. You just want to eliminate it completely. So from the tip of the dart, you're going to draw it out like I did similar over there. But this time, what you do is you want to take, I'm going to use this ruler because I have it here in my hand, but I'm going to put a half inch of seam allowance on both sides of this. And now, now look and see, this is still where our tip is. Way up here, the half inch seam allowance comes way down here. Shit, that's almost a, an inch and a half right there. But you, you go ahead and cut this out. Now, if you're using regular Sunbrella, and this is gonna be a rough edge in here, you can't use scissors. You need to use a hot knife right there to cut that out so that you can seal this edge so it doesn't fray all over everything. But once you have that cut out, this actually becomes a bit easier because I can just put the two together and now what I'm doing is I'm just going to do basically a flat felled seam if you saw that other video. So let me, let me crease that out the way, it, the way it lays. And if you flip this over and look, the top of our dart is right there. So you can come in here and indicate that, that, that this is the top of the dart. So it's... it's <clears throat> See how that's laying like that? That's the top of the dart way up there. This is where our cut is. So what I don't want to do is I don't want to come and sew this, you know, just with that half inch. I want to bring my stitch line all the way to that tip. That's the only difference between doing a flat felled seam and doing a dart. Back tack it. Again, see my right hand? Not moving. Now then you can come through here and see how when I open this up, I have my stitch line right to the tip of the dart right there. So again, open it all up. When you go to sew this, come down half inch or an inch-ish, however much control you have in the machine, start back up to the tip and then keep going then go down forward and when you get down here back tack that again so that it doesn't come undone on you and you have another dart so without beating a dead horse here the most important thing is a you get this sewn straight you don't so that you're not putting a big curve in it and you get the fabric folded out so that the tip is the tip. Let me show you why, let me show you what, if I can just, it, it is important, it is important. So if I have a tip right there and I have a dart that's coming down here, I can take this and if I fold it, I can grab this and actually fold it over bigger 
I can fold it over bigger. Let me let me put a little stitch line right here. Even though I just started sewing at the tip, the tip has got all this, the tips inside there and it has all this material folded over and you have too big of a darter. You're gathering up too much material in there and it could make the project not fit. So very important to get the tip started at the tip and run it, run it down straight. So those are two different ways of making darts. Um, of course, there are, there are more, but if you get these two systems of dart making down, there's pretty much nothing out there cover wise that you can't make by just simply pulling in darts, okay? Um, all right, that's it. There, we're gonna go into uh, we're gonna go into some others. So stay tuned. So let's talk about binding. Binding. Um, unquestionably, this is not only the hardest thing there is to do sewing wise. It's also equally as the most frustrating thing that you can do. And I'll tell you, and I'll tell you exactly why. We buy these binding attachments. This is three quarter inch binding. So we have a three quarter inch binding attachment. Now, all the binding that we use here in our shop is called double fold, which means it's three quarters of an inch with a quarter of an inch that's folded and glued or basted or whatever, whatever they do in their process. They fold that over and bond it together. But if you take a ruler and you measure this thing out exactly, I can tell you right now, that 90% of the time, it's not gonna be three quarters of an inch. So these binding attachments, this is all I use. That's all I use. They're, they make a billion of these things and there's, you know, there's, Ardwin Attachments makes all kinds of binding attachments. I typically just get these basic ones and honestly, I think there's probably a lot of people that sell them, but we, we get them from Manor Hirsch. It's who I've been buying them from for the past 30 years. So it's where I get them. But written right on the top of this, it says 20 millimeter. Sometimes you buy them and they'll say three quarters of an inch. Sometimes I buy a three quarter inch binder and I get it and it says 20 millimeters. I don't know that it makes any difference. I have not found that it makes any difference, but what I have found is sometimes you'll buy one of these binding attachments and it simply just will not work. It doesn't fold this binding over properly to where you can sew it equally on the top and the bottom when you put this in here. And if I can get this close up, let me stand up so I can do this. Here's, here's the problem. The, the binding attachment where you stick the fabric inside here winds up being wider or bigger. See that? See how I can move this up and down like that? That's the problem is the, the binding as you put pressure on it when you're sewing, it'll pull it up and sew it on the top further or the bottom and then it'll push it back down. So the inconsistency I've found comes from the binding company that's making the binding. That's where the inconsistency comes from because this never changes. And if you find one that has a proper fold on it and it folds it evenly, it's the binding that's giving you the problems. And that's just luck of the draw. Okay, so that being said with understanding that that that's where the inconsistency comes from, that's gonna eliminate a lot of your frustration thinking that it's you doing the missing when you're sewing. Well, it is you, <laughs> but, but that's, what you're, that's what it is. So again, um, however you attach this to the machine, you wanna make sure that the binding attachment gets, it's, it's permanent, you know. I really dislike those flip away ones because what happens is when you, if they, they flip back, I think they flip back, we don't use them. But it, when you reverse, it pushes the binding attachment out of the way. So my, my preferred method is to actually take, you know, little, bolt, little bolts or screws or whatever and, and mount it on there. So now I also have another screw because this 2, 255 has a moving plate that this gets bolted onto. So I have a screw that holds that plate down it screws that plate down so that it can't move, right? Um, on the 206, if you've seen that yet, on the 206, um, we don't have that plate because it's a side loader 
and the binding attachment actually just gets bolted to the deck, the table, makes it a little easier. Um, so now when I put this, actually I'm going to get a different an camera angle here because I want to show you the, what, what, we, what I do. All right, hang on, let's get a different angle. So when you put the binding into the attachment and it makes the fold right there, you want, you want this to be positioned so that you're sewing about, about in the center, maybe a little bit further over, an eighth of an inch-ish from, from the side right there. So I can't tell you exactly how to put it on your machine, depending on what toe size you have and whatnot. But um, <clears throat> I use I use the edge of the edge of this little adjustment bar. Let me show you that too, real quick. So this is an adjustment bar right there. But you can move that in and out so that you can rest you can rest the foot up against that little that little bar that's right there. And that you can bend that in and out to make fine adjustments on there. But so I use the edge, I use the edge of that to line up with the center of the toe for me. So just figure out where you're gonna where you need to put your binding attachment on so that you can put it on the same way every time. So put your binding in and stitch it down. So let me okay. See how that's almost right in the center right there? That makes sense to me because the more material that I start stuffing inside there, the, wide, the thicker this is going to get and the further to the outside, the further to the outside I'm going to sew. So with nothing or just one layer of material, you want it just offset of center line. So that two or three or four bits of material when you stick them in there, you can use the same setting so in this stitch line will just go further outboard the more material you stuff in there and the, the thicker that it gets. So all right, with the with the with this type of attachment, if I put this material straight up against it flat this way and start sewing, odds of me missing or running off are pretty good. And that's what makes this so frustrating. So what I want to do is, if you can see that, see how I have maybe about 20 degrees. You know, if this is straight right here and I'm going sewing straight in, I want to kick this out maybe about 20 degrees, sometimes even 30 degrees and push it in so I'm sewing that way. I'm sewing into the needle or I'm, I'm feeding it into the needle. So, and I guess when I'm, when I'm looking, I'm, I'm getting my head over and I'm looking right about here, making sure that this edge is going into the material, into the binding right there and then going forward. Honest to God, easier said than done. But now if you look at the back side, See how, where am I at right there? See how I have a sixteenth, maybe a little bit more of material that's sticking down from the stitch line, or that I caught it. And if you look at the top, look, there's more. So that's what I'm talking about with the inconsistency of the binding, meaning that it, this this binding isn't folding over exactly in half because of the binding not fitting in the slot. You're just going to have to deal with it. It's the way it is, and I've never found a binding attachment that doesn't do this, all right? So cut your end off when you're going to continue to bind. Again, lift your foot up, stick that binding in. Now, I'm not sticking it in past where my needle is. I'm just sticking it in so it goes in there, and do the same thing. You start, back tack over the top of it, and then bind. And Okay, so steering wise what I'm doing uh, I'm actually using both hands in this case to steer because I'm I can actually fold this out this way and uh, keep my left hand with everything being pushed in and kind of push this out so I'm getting that angle to go in there 
and if you if you sometimes if you I don't know how to explain it, but you almost want it to go in kind of like a curve, but straight to keep that. A lot of what I'm saying, if, you, if you've never done this, you'll see, but a lot of what I'm saying, it will make sense when you start to try to do this. So again, my, my needle is up, so I'm not lifting my foot, but stick that, stick that in there. Back tack. Keep going. Cut it off. Got a phone dinging. Okay, so I got a, a U-zip or a cutout, maybe it's a pole or whatever, and we need to make a cutout here. But typically what I'll do is I'll go past it. I'll go past it like this, stick this in there. Back tack. Remove that, come over here, and then... Now the reason why I do that, why did, why did I do that? Because I could have just stopped, started right there, sewn this, stopped, started right there. Well. Now that I have this piece of binding and this piece of binding, if when I'm doing this radius, I miss, and, the, and a, the binding comes off, and I need to cut it off, I can cut it completely off of here and not disturb what I've already done. If I've, if I've sewn through there, that came back and then started this on top again, when I, then I discover that the binding is missed, now I have to go back and I have to fix this side too, because the other binding is inside it. Blah, blah, blah. All right. Um, to make to go through around a radius right here, what you do is you can do it in series of folds, right? So see where see where the it's it's straight right there, and then the the curve just starts to curve. <clears throat> I'm going to take and pinch right there, and I'm just going to flatten it out, straighten it out. And as I go, I can continue to make little pinches on here and straighten this out. You can even go as far as folding some of it over. And making it straight. So I'll show you. So you put it in here, back tack it, sew up to just before the curve. When you get there, you can you can pinch it like this and, and straighten it out. Stick it in there. Once you get just a little bit now, move that one out of the way. Move your pinch line up a little bit further. So, and keep going. So, I'm right in the middle of the corner. The other way to do this, well, I mean, the other way to do this is to actually fold it back and sew it. So, just practice. You just need to know that when this goes in, it needs to be straight when it goes through there. And there's different methods of folding this, this back. But when you look at this now, See how it's, it's nice and flat and you don't see any type of folds, right? Because when I sewn it, sewed it, I sewed it when it was flat. I didn't sew, sew over like a dart per se, like the tip of a dart. I'm just using a dart or pinching it to straighten it out. And if you look inside and outside, see here's the inside of it. Perfectly sewn on there, it's perfectly caught. You can actually feel, if you pinch, you can actually feel where the fabric is when it comes inside there. So always when you're doing binding, you need to go back and double check to make sure that you've stitched this down because the last thing you want to do is get to the boat and have a missed piece of binding, which is a very common thing that happens in this industry. So um, that's binding, the 101, that's basic binding. Um, now what I do too is I'll come back these ends, I will, I don't like to smell the burning sunbrella too much, but I will, uh, I will cut those off. Then I take my hot knife and just seize these edges so, so that they don't fray. Now, look here. See how that's, it's a burnt mark right there? Um, I've been questioned about that more than one time. It just is the way it is when you're doing binding. So there's there's a lot of reasons to do binding. Um, if you can if you can get away with not doing binding, you're always better off. I, I'm not a fan of binding, but it's a necessary evil and it's necessary to know how to do it. So just keep in mind that you have to seize that edge or it will fray and look like crap within a month. All right. So that's binding the short version.
All right, so you bought a sewing machine, good. Um, let's go, let me go through this. This happens to be a Conso 255 RB3. There's RB2s, RB1s, 255s. Um, there's different models. You may have a Juki or a, or a Sailrite machine or um, an Adler or a Faf. There's a billion sewing machines out there. Um, they're, all, they're all the same function, different configuration. There's not one that's gonna be really better than the other. So um, I like the Conso, but it's just an economic thing. They're relatively cheap, they're good, they're easy to work on. You know, there's a lot of reasons why I use the Consos, but for the most part, <clears throat> they're all gonna be the same. And let me tell you what you need to have in order to make boat canvas. That's one simple thing. That's a walking foot, which means, see how this is walking when this treadle goes around? The, the toe, that center toe right there is, is pulling the material through. The needle goes down, the presser feet come together, goes onto the feed dog and it pulls it back through. That's one thing that you have to have. The other way is the old, like a home sewing machine uh, um, is different. It doesn't, I think the, the top, it's just the feed dog on the bottom walk, but the foot itself doesn't walk. So you wanna make sure that the, you have a walking foot, means that this toe right there, the center toe, goes forward and backward and pulls the material through there. The other thing that's very important is to have a reverse. Um, this one happens to be pushed down for a reverse. You have other ones that have a knob and you lift it up for a reverse. Um, matter of fact, there's even machines where there's a different treadle button where you push it and, it and it would go into reverse. But reverse is very important for, um, for doing what we do because we do a lot of back tacking People that have the old style Singer sewing machines that have a walking foot but no reverse, what they wind up doing is they'll sew, they'll lift their needle out, they'll pull the material back, put the needle back in and then stitch again and that makes sort of a back tack on it. But you leave that extra thread in there, blah, 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 it looks like crap, takes a lot longer. So make sure if you're going to get a sewing machine that it has a walking foot and a reverse. Those are the main characteristics of it. Now. Um, this is, and I'll show you in just a bit, this, these machines that we have are driven by a servo motor. It's the newest thing. They're not really that new anymore, but um, the servo motor is quiet. As you can tell right now, it's on and you don't hear a sound, which I like. The old style big half horse clutch motors, which it was just what it said, it was a clutch motor. There was a bar that pushed the wheel in and once it got pushed in, it engaged and it went on, but there's a loud hum and you could always hear it, and when it, when it was engaged, it was just loud. So I really like the servo motor. You even have more control of the treadle with the servo motor. But um, as far as the machine goes, um, this 255 RB3, can, honestly, the main reason why I use this machine is because it has this enormous bobbin on it. It Not only is it bigger in diameter, it's also wider, and that width gets a lot more a lot more thread wound into it. Um, the 206, which I'm going to show you if you haven't already seen it, has a similar sized bobbin, but it's narrower and it's a side loader. Pros and cons to both one, both of them. I use both of them. I can't recommend either one of them. I would tend to say that most people like the 206 um, for whatever reason. And with the, the students, the majority of my students like the 206 better than they do the 255, but nonetheless. Um, so with the 255, let's start, let me go with, through the threading of it. Um, when you wind a bobbin, which this is the bobbin right here, I always wind my own bobbins too. Um, I don't like, I don't like the pre-wound bobbins simply for the fact that A, they're a pain in the butt to get the thread out of, which makes me angry and I can control the tension with the tensioner on my bobbin. So I, I can control how much, uh, how much tension gets wound on here, which makes a difference the way this, the thread comes out of the machine, the tension on the bobbin itself. But the, to load this machine, you wanna have the thread on the left side of the bobbin, and you put it in there and clip that down. Actually, let me get a tighter view on this. Okay, so 
again, this the thread goes on the left side. You put it in there, and then there's a little bitty split right here, which all machines are going to do this. Now, every single one of them, there's going to be a way for you to lace the bobbin thread through. All right, so I'm going to push it down there, and what this is going to do, it's going to I'm going to pull it around and underneath, and the tension the the tensioner for the bobbin is a little plate that wraps right around the side of there. You probably can't see it, but there's this is not the right size screwdriver either, but there's two screws. One holds the tension plate or the tension bar on there, and there's another screw that you can tighten and loosen to get the, the tension on the bobbin. So the idea here is when you pull it, when you pull it out and you stop pulling, the bobbin doesn't keep spinning on there. So you, if, if you do it, that's what they do call a backlash. If that bobbin spins, it's going to backlash. And the next time you try to start, it's going to want to ball up or wad up on you. So <clears throat> that's, what, that's what you, how you adjust the tension on the bobbin case is that little screw right there. Um, the top thread now, let me find some top thread. Let me, let me back back up here. Okay, so uh, make sure you get the, the bobbin. Let me cut some of this. The, the bobbin wound in, put through the little thing, slid up underneath, leave the thread there on the top. There are, on this machine, there's two funnels right there to put the thread through. And then there are three holes so this is going to this is going to become part of the top tension this whole mechanism right here. I found that if I wrap this through here twice rather than three times it makes a difference so, so you know, there's three holes there so you could actually wrap it through all three holes. This <clears throat> with the adjustment knob on it and the spring that's your top thread tension and what you do is you go around it and then I, you kind of pull on it to make sure that you seat the thread all the way down inside there. If you take, took this apart, you would see that there's like a little bubble in it and you want to get the thread underneath there where the tension plates are actually touching each other. Now there's, <clears throat> you can't also probably can't see this, but there's a little bar that sticks out that holds that in place. You do not want to go up and over that little um, tent or that little adjustment bar or guide bar is all that is. So on the bottom side here, now this is your tension spring. So this is your thread tensioner here, and this down here is a tension spring. Well, on the back side of this, and this is going to be the same on, on most all sewing machines, on the back side of this, there's, there's like a little piece of metal that's, that's split that pops inside, and you want to get your thread up so that it goes inside here. So wrap this around. Pull it down underneath, and now I'm going to pop it up. You can hear it. You can hear that. It pops it up right underneath there. There's, like I said, you want to get that thread to go inside there. Now when this thread gets pulled, every time that foot goes through, you can see that that tensioner right there is going to help keep, the again, the backlash. You're keeping the backlash out of the thread so that when that needle comes back up, it will loop properly for the hook to come around to grab it. So there's also an adjustment to that. On this machine, it's, it's inside. There's a screw that I can loosen, and then I can, I can take this nut off here, and then I could, there's, a, there's a, fill, a flathead screw in here that I could tighten that spring or loosen that spring, not to adjust it up and down so much, but adjust how much tension for the backlash there is. Um, the more that you know about these sewing machines, the better off you're going to be. So if you, once you get it set up, explore and um, just know how many different ways there are to tension this thing. Simply having that spring out of adjustment can make your sewing machine not sew right. So it's critical. Same thing with the amount of tension. If you're, if you're sewing and you need to adjust your tension and it just won't adjust right, you know, the next spot I would look would be here before I went into a whole timing issue with the, the machine being out of time so it's not working right. But So I took the thread up and I went through 
um, the the I don't you know I, I'm I know what the stuff is, but I don't know what a lot of these terms are. The bar that goes up and down that makes the the needle bar going up and down. It's called something uh, I don't know what it is, but anyways, go through that, come down. Now this. <clears throat> This machine, and, and most machines do have, have a, I just dropped it, that's great. It comes with a little felt, little piece of felt that goes in there. And again, that's for um, keeping the tension. What I like to use, and I've, I've always, I've just always done this. There's probably some machine guys tell me that I'm doing it wrong, but nonetheless. I use a piece of Velcro, and I fold a piece of Velcro up because I can also put a couple drips of oil and this Velcro holds that oil in there and it sort of lubricates the thread as it's going through. So, cause that needle will get really hot as you're sewing. And if you have some lubrication on your thread, it's not gonna try to break the thread as you're sewing in there. So I just stick that piece of Velcro in there and then I bring the thread right to the back side of it. Now on the needle bar itself, there's another spot where the thread has to come through, and that's, again, going to be typically on every sewing machine. Whether you have to feed it through or this one, you can just pop it inside there, but it goes right inside there. And then if the bobbin is on this side of the needle, you feed the thread towards the bobbin. So always from left to right. So you get the, the thread in and make sure that you don't twist the thread around the needle. So now in order to get the, the top thread up through, if you leave, this, leave the bottom thread hanging out, hold the top thread, rotate, rotate it around one time, it's going to come around, it's going to grab that bottom bobbin thread, and if you just pull on it a little bit, it will pull it straight up. And then take your scissors. Uh, they didn't get it. Take your scissors and pull it through, and now I have the bobbin thread up through the hole, and the top thread, or the top thread, is through the needle down inside there. All right, so that's just this machine. That's just this machine. Keep in mind, there, you, if you buy a new machine, you're going to have uh, threading instructions. So just follow the instructions because they're never wrong. Um, Let's talk about a couple more things on here. So this knob right here, and most all machines are going to have this. What this does is it adjusts the, the amount of stitches per inch, all right? Um, and it doesn't, I set mine on eight. I set mine on eight. I set all of these, these 255s on eight. I think it winds up putting about six, actually about six stitches per inch. So somewhere in between there, somewhere between six, seven inches of uh, stitches per inch works pretty good. Um, you definitely don't want like three stitches an inch and have big long spreads. The odds of that thread getting cut and then fraying is going to be pretty good. So um, in order to change the, the tension on this, you can't just turn this knob. You have to push the reverse down and then you can make adjustments to the tension but for what the way it's set up, you have to push the reverse down and then make your adjustments. And that, what that does is it, it adjusts how far this moves every time it goes down. So that's what that is. Um, now oiling the machine. Um, this machine has gotten a little bit old since we've been here in the shop starting to use it. But there are little red dots. Red dots. And these used to be red, but they're worn off. And with an oiler, typically I have an oil can that just has a little tip on there. Um, this is an eyeglass where you put this in here and you actually fill it until it, there's two red lines inside there. You get the amount of oil that goes up to the top. Um, all of these little spots on the deck you put oil on. There's spots up here, there's spots in the back. So any little red dot, and you only need to drip. You know, there's a couple right here you put drips on and those you know adjust or uh, oil the the all the parts that are just rotating and moving around here so the other thing that i like to do is um, <clears throat> where this bobbin the bobbin ro runs on a groove that goes around there 
and that's constantly moving it's constantly getting hot so i'll actually come in and i'll put some oil on that that drive that mechanism and that's probably the most important spot i think that this in this machine that you need oil now this one also has a little dipstick so the this dipstick and this fill internally in here especially if you look underneath there's little felt or foam cords that trace around everything so you have oil reservoirs that when you fill them up they just saturate and penetrate it's like a wick and the wick keeps different parts of this thing lubricated but it doesn't mean that they're self lubricating the entire machine so do keep oil in this stuff but I would still go through and I drip this oil around on all the spots now you look underneath here see there's a red dot there this is <clears throat> there's red dots here you know anything that look anything that moves i'm going to put oil on now inside this case right here is where the oil comes down and you can see these tubes that are running through here that's what those are is they're oiler tubes there's some in the back too and they're definitely the ones inside that you can't get to so <clears throat> um that's it for so maintenance wise um Maintenance wise, it's just a, it's, you know, every other day thing for me. And if I'm sewing a lot, I'll do it a lot. But what I always wind up doing is putting a couple drops of oils on, on that bobbin. Um, makes a big difference. So um, let me, let me take, let me pause right now and I'm going to go get a needle and show you some, talk about some needles for a second. All right, so sewing needles. Um, there's a million brands on the, on the market and I'm not going to get into all of them I'll talk about a couple different ones but this is what we use in here for these machines sewing boat canvas on a daily basis so what that says is a 135 17 um, the size is, is a the 20 135 17 by 20 basically what that means is there's a measurement for the the size of the barrel where you stick that up and the set screw holds it in there's another measurement that says the size of the length of the needle and then the 20 is the size of the hole so you can get a 135 17 by 22 which means there's a bigger hole or an 18 which means there's a smaller hole but the needle barrel width length and diameter is are the same when you say it's a 135 17 so um, without getting into too much detail about how needles work, if you, if you have one of these machines or something comparable and you're sewing boat canvas and you go to order, so, go to order needles, those are perfectly sufficient for what we do. Matter of fact, that's all we use in here. Um, now, they do make uh, the same sized needle with different tips on there. Now, let, let me just say... I don't buy the most expensive needles on the market, but I also don't buy the, the cheapest ones on the market. I get this standard size, these Schmetz, if that's how it's pronounced, um, because they get broke a lot and, we've, and we've, we replace them a lot. And sometimes even when they don't get broke, they get dull and you replace them anyways. So keep a sharp needle and you can, you can tell with your needle when it's in the machine, you know, be careful with it. But if you just put your finger on the bottom of it and kind of just rub your finger against the bottom, you can tell if it's dull or if it's sharp. And if it's, if it's gotten really dull, take it out, replace it, put another one in. If it still has a sharp point on there, they're still good. Um, now, you also have to watch out for getting a bent needle. So a bent needle it can be very hard to visually see if it's bent, but it will completely make your sewing... Um, the stitches miss and hook and loop and, and do all kinds of stuff with a bent needle. So pay attention to that. But that, I just want to show you that that's the, the right size that we use. Um, if you get too big of a diameter needle, you're popping a super big hole in there. And then the thread that we use doesn't fill the hole up. And then you get leaking, which I'm not, that's a whole topic leaking all by itself. But um, so then thread, um, we use... If I use a polyester thread, which is a cheap poly nylon mix, um, I use the size V138. V138. Now they make a V92. It's a little bit lighter. Um, don't recommend it because you don't get the breaking strength. So you want to run the 138. Which it's a thicker thread. Um, the 
when we use a PTFE thread, it's called SolarFix. The so that's what I recommend is SolarFix, and it's a 2400 SolarFix. That is the equivalent to the 138 in the polyester type thread. So SolarFix 2400, I think the linear, the smaller one is the 2000. So comparable, it's V92, V138, or SolarFix 2000, SolarFix 2400. Use the bigger ones. So, uh, oh, one more thing too. If you guys are gonna get into doing any type of macrolon or, or some 80 mil strata glass, they make these needles with different types of cuts. This happens to be just a point cut on, on these needles, but you can get them with, I think it's called a diamond cut, where they actually have like four grooves on there and it will punch through some harder material. Um, definitely more expensive to buy those. And then I think they has also have some like hardened tipped type needles. Um, but, and you can get into all that stuff if you want to, but I can tell you right now, we don't do macrolon because we bond acrylic, but so everything else is, is this needle, and this is the only needle that we buy in this shop. So point blank, if you want a good needle, there you go. So this is our 250, or uh, I'm sorry, this is our 206 RB5 console. It's the newest console, the newest 206 that they're making is the RB5. And as you can tell, it may just be size-wise just a bit smaller, but the throat and the depth of here to here, this opening is the same. Um, it's got the same reverse on here, and the, the tinch or the stitch length is up here. It's in the re relatively same spot, but this one, you can see it even has a little button that says push to make that, to do your adjustments. Instead of holding the reverse down like the other machine does, you just push that button and you can adjust the length of the stitch on your needle. But this whole contraption up here is exactly the same. Here you have your top thread tension, you have your tension spring in here, you have a little clip that goes back in there, and it gets routed exactly the same. There's even a little, you know, little spot here just above the needle, and the thread gets uh, goes in from left to right the same way. The difference now is there's no plate. The plate is on this side. The bobbin, there's actually an independent bobbin case that you actually you can put into your hand. This has the same thing. There's a bar on here and that's where the thread comes out of this little hole. There's two little screws. One holds it on, the other one adjusts the tension for the bobbin. And you do this the same way as you do on the 255. You put the thread on the left I put it into the bobbin case, then there's a little split where the thread comes goes into, and then you pull it underneath that tensioner right there, and then you're, you're ready to go. So this has a spring on it, a little spring on it, so if you pull that spring out, what that does is it holds the bobbin in so that it won't drop out of there. And now, this particular machine, in order to get the bobbin in and out, over here there are two dots. If you, when you line those two dots up, what that does is it gets it into the right orientation underneath. So th there's, a, there's a little spot over here that's got a guide that has to go in. You, you get good at it. You can do it by hand very easily. And you do the same thing. You just take, you hold your top thread, pull this around. And if you give a little bit of tug on there, then you can pull the bottom thread right out of it. Um, if you, if, you, if you can't get it, you just can't get it, the easiest thing to do is just to go ahead and pull this up. Well, again, I want to make, I want to make sure that I get these two dots over here lined up. And then I can pull the spring out and pull that bot. Well, I've got the foot's on it. The foot's holding the thread on there. But now I can, I can do it and I can see what, I'm, what I've got going on. Let that go. Um, but again, Put the, put the bobbin thread on the left hand side, put it onto the bobbin case, pull it through that split up underneath the tensioner, hold the spring out so you can hold the whole thing in one unit, put it in there, let it go. And then once, you, once it's down there, you just let this thread hang. You can grab the top, roll it around, comes pops up you can see it just take my scissors and I scoop it right out of the, the barrel bottom there 
Um, so oiling is the same thing. Difference, the difference is there's a inside here on the top, it actually even says oil right there. There's a little sponge, basically a piece of felt that you uh, saturate that and that oils through. And then you have your little red dots all the way around up here on the, on the top, on the back side. And then this one you can actually get inside. You can do the other side too, or the other machine. But there's some, you'll see some cords in here too. And you just put some drops of oil. Um, very good maintenance to keep those all oiled up. And same bobbin, same bobbin loader. And now the, uh, the knee lift, the knee lift on here um, is in a different spot than on the 255. So you, it's, you can't really swap the heads out. The bases are the same, but the knee lift position is a different. So if you have to put, if you use one machine or the other on the same table, you have to move the knee lift on there. Um, but that's all there is to it. There's, you know, this machine's just a little simpler, I guess, just a little, little calmer um, than the 255. But strength wise, Strength-wise, they're going to be the same, and not to mention you have the same servo motor. You have the same motor that's driving both machines, so you'll never notice a difference in power between the two. So it has, the, the sewing machine head has nothing to do with the amount of power that goes in there. But I'm telling you right now that this is just as adequate. And I had I had a Conso 206. Matter of fact, it's the other machine that's in our shop. Um, I had that in one of my work trucks that I personally used probably for about 10 years. So, and honest to God, the only reason why I have the 255 is because it's got a bigger bob, and that's why I like it. So, there you go. Those are the two machines that we have. Your machine's going to be very, very similar. So, just read the instructions, and it should all be good, okay?